frustrating, but at the same time, it enables that uh, online, and, and that's a great thing that we can have both for those who can't make it. So I um, have a, a few announcements, uh, kind of our, our normal. If anybody has um, a special prayer that they feel that they'd like to meet with one of the elders, either come and see myself or one of the other elders after the service, we're very happy to do that with anybody who has a need. Um, we have our midweek Bible study on Wednesdays as normal. Um, we have a spring concert coming up on the 18th over at our school. And then uh, community cleanup on the 16th. Uh, this is where my eyes, I need to adjust. Yes, it does. It is a six. <laughs> um, and then community cleanup on the 19th. Um, and then uh, one small update. Uh, our speaker next week is actually uh, changed uh, as of yesterday, uh, so it'll be Ryan Haining, uh, who, if you recall, spoke a few uh, few weeks ago. Um, so, welcome again, and we'll have our opening song. Thank you.
bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come here today to worship you, to thank you for creating this beautiful planet that you've given us to live on, to thank you for the sacrifice of your son who died for us so we could go to heaven to be with you. We just ask that you'd send your Holy Spirit to be with us today and to guide our worship here. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our next song is 523. My faith has found a resting place.
When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. is a time where we have our offering. Uh, if our deacons and deaconesses could come forward. Um, I did forget an announcement earlier, and I just wanted, it's just an update uh, for folks. Uh, we had uh, three Zoom interviews for pastors this past week. Um, Monday evening, the elders will be meeting to decide which of the three we want to ask the conference to have come for an in-person interview. So just keep us in prayers as we keep moving through this process to get a pastor again. So uh, speaking of that, that's kind of local, right? Our church uh, offering today is local church budget. Um, you've probably heard me say this before. I did not realize until I was out of college that tithe did not help keep the lights on in the building. Um, that is done by our church, uh, local church budget offering. Um, maintenance and all of those types of things on the church building all come from that. Um, so not that you shouldn't give your tithes, but just remember to give both. So, uh, 
to have a, a verse in the reading here today. It's uh, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. Um, that verse just reminded me, if you look on the front of our bulletin, our church mission statement, faithfully serving others, anticipating Jesus' return. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today just thanking you again for the many, many blessings that you've given us, the financial blessings, blessings of our talent and of the time that we have here on this earth. And we just ask that you would bless what we give back to you, both for the local church budget, for our tithes and our other offerings, and if for our time and our dedication of all those who give their talents to serve. We just thank you so much, and we ask again that you would bless these for your use. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is Psalms 91, verse 15 through 16. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be in, with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 7 tells us, So then, neither who is he that planteth, neither him that watereth, but God that gives the increase. Can we kneel?
so we can pray, please. Oh, precious Jesus, Father, we thank you for being the God of increase. And Father, we just ask you, Lord, as we go through our sermon today, that you increase our hearing, you increase our understanding, Father, that you help the speaker. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for the church. Lord, we thank you for all the members in here. And Father, even though we don't have a shepherd at the moment, Lord, we're still here and we're still standing strong with your light shining within our church. And we thank you, Father. Lord, we ask you for your Holy Spirit to fall fresh on us each and every time we meet, Lord. Father, we ask you to change us, Lord, and make us more like you. Lord, this world has so much darkness in it, Lord. There's so much hurt and so much pain. And Father, a lot of us are experiencing that ourselves. But Lord, you keep our light. You keep your light shining within us, Lord. And your light will carry us through. Lord, we ask you to give us strength to hold on to you, Lord. We're going through a lot of things. I'm going through a few things myself, Father, as far as my seeing, my eyesight. And Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for keeping me up, for uplifting me with your righteous right hand. Because, Father, otherwise, I would not be able to do it. And Lord, I know there's other people in here that's going through things, Jesus, that only you can help them with. And Father, we just ask them for your Holy Spirit to be with all of us. Lord, help us to love the way you want us to love. Lord, help us to care the way you care for us. Lord, just fill us with you, because that's what we need in today's world. And we thank you, Lord, that we can come here with fellowship and love and the knowledge of you, Lord, and your light is in this church. And we thank you, Lord, and we depend on you, Father, to keep leading us and guiding us, Lord. Open our hearts, Lord, so we can be filled with you, Lord. Give us the desire to want to be with you all the time. Help us with the things that we cannot do on our own. We trust you, Father. We depend on you, Lord. And we thank you for loving us and keeping us. We thank you for our church, and we thank you for our church ministries, Lord. And we ask you to bless each of our ministries, Lord, and help us to flourish. Help your light shine, Lord, to draw others near. We just thank you, Father, for what you do for us. And we depend on you, and we know you'll continue. In your wonderful, precious name, amen. amen. children's story.
Test, test. So I'm going to be asking all of you, who do you want to meet in the Bible? First, we have to ask Miss Jane, who do you want to meet in the Bible and why? Uh, I'd love to meet um, Jonah. Yeah, you know, right now we have phones, and I can text Roy or my mom, and I'll, I'll tell them, I'm running late. I don't know what Jonah did when he got swallowed. I don't know what he told his wife and the kids, so I, I love to, to meet Jonah. Thank you. Okay. Who wants to tell, me, who wants to tell who, who they want to meet? I want to meet Samson. Why? Because he was strong. Thank you. Kate, how about you, Caitlin? I want to meet Daniel because he has the same name as my dad. <laughs> Does anyone else want to share? I want to meet David. Why? Because he also has the same name as my dad. <laughs> Does anyone here want to share? I would like to meet wait, um, King David. To Why? Because he's a king. Because <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Uh, does any adults want to share? Okay, no. I want to meet Gideon because he had faith in God. There you go. Oh, how about you, Caitlin? Again. I want to meet Psalm because um, because he's Psalm, so I want to meet Psalm. Okay. Here we go. Does any adults want to share? Because he's about to choose you if you're not. Okay. okay. Here we go. I'd like to meet Jesus because I have so many questions. Okay. Hello. James, Jesus' brother, because even though it's a very short book of the Bible, it's got a lot of really good stuff in it. Okay. Here we go. I want to meet God because God created us. Amen. The way back. I like to I like to uh, see the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and our guardian angels. I'd like to be with Enoch because he walked with God. Amen. Anyone back here? Anyone else? Oh. I'd like to meet Philip. Philip is the goal and the guidance of my life. Because of my wife, uh, I've become the eunuch in the story of Philip. Here you go. I want to meet Eve. I want to know what, what she's thinking. <laughs> Here you go. 
I would like to meet Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was very courageous. You know, he was um, a wee little man, as we sing. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. But then he had a big heart. He said, I want to see Jesus. I also want to see Jesus. How did he make it? There you go. I would uh, like to meet Job because he was faithful amidst all the trials. I would like to meet Peter, and again, it's because I want to know what he was thinking some of those, some of those times. I want to meet Daniel and ask him what it was like in the lion's den. Oh. Uh, that'd be okay. an experience for me to listen to him tell his story. That's a good answer. Anyone else? Here we go. I want to meet uh, John because he was, it said that he was the youngest of the uh, apostles and um, that uh, Jesus loved him and they were very, very close. And uh, so his experiences. Uh, being that that close and that tight with uh, Jesus for all those years, and and then being uh, banished uh, to the island of Patmos, so there's a lot to lot to learn from him. Good answer, sir. Close with that word of prayer. Dear Jesus. Thank you for this day. Let us have a good family Sabbath. Let us have a good day. What's our future about to be good? Be good. And let us have a good day. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing who your favorite Bible character is. Amen. I just want to introduce our speaker today, David. Uh, he's a father of five, um, one who's only a couple of weeks old, three weeks, you said? Uh, he is a, you know, uh, that, that resonates with me. I also have five. <laughs> uh, also, he's originally from Michigan. I'm originally from Michigan, um, and he's a man of God. So thank God, and thank you for being willing to come and share with us today. On. Oh. As Ariana told you, my name is the same as King David. <laughs> Thanks, Ari. Spilling that to everyone. Okay. Uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to come to your house for the Sabbath and worship. Please bless us as we partake of the bread of life and help us to learn something. May it not be my words, but your words during this time and go with us through this day and this week, Lord, in your name, amen. amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy. It's been a while since I've been up here. I appreciate uh, Joe giving me the opportunity. I, I last spoke in 2016 and I do most of my uh, sermons actually listening to Lee Venden, which is, <laughs> makes me laugh because now he's listening to me. Uh, thank you for that, no pressure. So uh, a quote that, I, that I've thought of many times over the years and that I've lived my life by says, a comfort zone is a beautiful place 
where nothing ever grows. A comfort zone is a beautiful place where nothing ever grows. How comfortable are you? How comfortable are you in your spiritual life? I want you to think about a tree. Have you ever climbed a tree? Maybe as a kid, some people. So a tree's real sturdy at the trunk, right? And then the branches right next to the tree are real sturdy as well. And then as the branches spread out, it gets pretty flimsy. So if you were climbing a trees and you started to inch out onto the limb, you get a little bit more scared because it's, it's less sturdy, right? I think like in our spiritual life, it's very interesting because a lot of times we like to be close to the trunk of the tree. We don't really want to spread out and go out on a limb. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today is some of the interesting things that I've been through personally. Uh, going out on a limb helps you to find out how powerful God can work in your life and see him working in different ways. So I want you to think about that in your comfort zone as I'm telling you these stories. So first I'm going to start off with Psalm 91, 1 and 2. I purposely did not have a PowerPoint with all the scripture because everyone should be bringing their Bible. What if we were in a time where digital was no longer and your batteries died on your tablet? You got to bring your Bible. So... Psalm 91, verse 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. In 2001, Miss Worley was my Bible teacher at Auburn Academy, and she, along with my grandmother, had convinced me to go on a mission trip to Costa Rica. I spent two weeks there building a school. It was great. Um, it impacted me so much because the people there were like real chill. Nobody had a watch and things, and I was like, wow, this is like totally a slower lifestyle. I decided I was gonna go back, and I started promising everybody, all my friends, Chris and my brother and everyone else, I'm, I'm gonna live there. People thought I was probably delusional, but the following fall, I had actually convinced my brother, let's drive there and do something. All I have is this car and this Nintendo 64. I'm, I'm at the trunk of the tree. We're not doing anything. We're not helping anybody. So we decided to just drive there. Now, when you're 17 years old and you decide to drive through seven countries, you probably should do a little more planning than I did. We only had $300. Um, but we were just going to figure it out as we went, right? So I have to skip parts of the story, but we started from Green Bay, Wisconsin, on November 3rd, 2001. When we got to Monterey, we'd already been robbed countless times and, and various things had happened. But we were doing great. <laughs> in Monterey, we got lost in the middle of the night. And this is significant because we were driving a 1988 Dodge conversion van. And if you know anything about those, I was actually reading about this exact model of conversion van with the, with the V8. They get about 12 miles per gallon, maybe 15, but it's never as good as it says on the MPG rating. So we got lost. We drove around Monterey two, three times. Uh, Mid-morning, I remember we, it was a Thursday, and we had finally, you know, sort of found our way south. The reason why we kept getting lost over and over is because we only had one map. There was no GPS back then, by the way, obviously. So we had a map of, of Latin America. It was Mexico to Panama. And we had decided we were going to go to Costa Rica. So in every single country all the way down, it's just one map. You really don't have a lot to go by. It's not like you can like turn down 88 and we'll go three miles and then we'll change. No, you just had this one long map. So we had the Pan American Highway we were going to ride all the way down, okay? 
The thing was, is that when we were looking at the map, Costa Rica only was a real small country, so it only had two tiny little cities. One of them, San Jose, and the other one said, Alleluia. I didn't know how to speak Spanish at the time, so I thought it was Alleluia, so I'm like, we're going to Alleluia. It sounds amazing. <laughs> Turns out it was Alajuela. <laughs> so in Monterey, we were lost because of this terrible map that we had. And we started finally going south again on the Pan American Highway after wasting a bunch of gas. So we're cruising along and we're, we're doing great because now we're, we're, you know, we're trucking, we're, we're on our way south again, we're gonna make it. And right about halfway down the road, my brother said, look at that sign. And the sign said, San Victoria. 236 kilometers, and I went cold because our gas gauge said a quarter tank. And when the sign says next gas, 236 kilometers, I'm doing the math in my head, that's 152, 158 miles, and we've got a quarter tank of gas, which is about four gallons, which is gonna get us about 48 miles if we're lucky, and we're in the middle of the desert and there's nobody around except maybe some shrubs and an occasional cactus. And I thought right away, Lord Jesus, please do not let us get stranded in the desert. I really don't want to try to sleep out here. So I started praying. And I, and I pray, prayed, you know, God, please don't let us be stranded in the desert. So we kept driving. About 20 minutes later, my brother goes, we've got an even bigger problem. And I was like, how could we have a bigger problem? He said, the gas gauge is broken. And I said, how do you know? He said, because look, it hasn't moved in the last 30 miles. And so immediately I thought, oh no, worst case scenario, right? That means we probably even have less gas than we thought. So we're going to run out at any minute. So we waited to run out. And we just kept driving. We kept praying. Two hours later, San Victoria on the sign, 90 kilometers. We're like, wow, we're actually getting kind of close. We might not have to walk more than two days. <laughs> we kept driving. The, the, the gas gauge is still stuck on a quarter tank. So now we're 100% sure it's broken. Okay? There's no doubt it hasn't moved. It's been hours. The sun's getting low in the sky. We're about 40 kilometers away. We're like, okay, this is maybe walking distance for a night's walk or so, 20 miles, but it's still the desert, and it's still Mexico, and I'm 17 years old, and I'm white, and I don't speak any Spanish. And it's, that sounds scary to me. We start seeing billboards coming into town. The gas gauge is still stuck at a quarter tank. I thought, we're, we're maybe going to make it. Right as we start to get on the main street, and all the street lights are there, and all the billboards advertising things that I can't understand, and, and it says, bienvenidos. I had to look that up in the dictionary, and it says, welcome. It was my first Spanish word. We get onto the main street, and immediately the gas gauge, I saw with my own eyes, goes to zero. And the car sputters and stops, and my brother just rips the steering wheel to the right, and we just coast down this hill and into the darkness on this gravel road into this parking lot, and we're like, we'll just sleep here. We made it. Praise God. Couldn't really believe our, our, our eyes or what happened. We're just like, well... Let's just sleep. That was stressful. The next morning, we woke up in the parking lot of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. How's that for miracles? God's like, you know what? I got you. We kept driving. 
we stayed in San Victoria two days. We had to sell some stuff for, for gas. And so since we were moving there, we had all these things. I just remember this giant stuffed white tiger that was bigger than I was. And we were selling that out of the back of our van for a few pesos, along with some Game Boys and some other things. And we got like 30-some pesos. We put some gas in our, our van. We kept going. The next town down, uh, Tampico, was this huge town with this oil refineries and all this stuff. And we got lost terribly. And we kept driving around the city trying to get out of Tampico, and we couldn't find the exit. So on our fourth time, we finally see this bridge, and we're like, well, if we go down that hill right there, we might get up to that bridge, and maybe that gets us out of here. So sure enough, we come around, and I'm like, right there, that's it. And he like weaves over, and we get off on this exit, and it takes us way down this hill, and we come up. And we're on this bridge, and we're way above the city suddenly. We can see this whole city, and we're like, that's where we were lost this whole time. And we get onto this bridge, and we're really excited because we're getting out of the city. There's the river below us. There's the city. The beautiful sunset's happening. And we come to a stop. All this traffic suddenly. And I'm like, why did we stop? We look way up ahead. And it was my worst nightmare. A toll. The only toll ever. <laughs> the bar's across the road, and there's seven, eight cars in front of us, and I'm like, this is not good. We don't have any money. We spent it all on gas to get here, to waste getting lost. So we were really paranoid, and my brother was like, you need to look around in all the couch cushions in the back and in the, under the carpeting. This is a conversion van. If you remember those, they had carpeting on the ceiling and the floor and everywhere else. So I'm like ripping stuff up, trying to find some change. And we're getting closer and closer and closer to the toll tendon. And this guy was scary, man. He had the full body armor with the vest. He had the M16. He had the aviators and the big mustache, and he just stood there real serious. This is the scariest toll attendant I've ever seen. How are we going to make it out of this one? So I'm scrounging in the back. I'm looking in the glove box. I'm looking everywhere. We can't find any change at all. And we're next. And I'm sweating. I think that's where my anxiety issues came from. And then my brother, he's like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, don't look at me. You're driving. <laughs> so the car in front of us, the, you know, the gate goes up and the car moves off. And then it's just us. And we're coming real slowly up to him and reluctantly rolling down our window. And we don't understand anything he's saying. But we know he wants money. And my brother, like, still frantically looking around. And he reaches down into the side compartment of the vehicle, and he pulls out a mag flashlight, and he just gently puts it in the man's hand, who never changes his facial expression. His aviators, he's cool. He's got his gun. He looks at the flashlight, and he looks at us, and he clicks it on and off, and it turns on and off. And without doing anything else, he lets the gate go up. And we're like, thank you, Jesus. Flashlights are sometimes currency, apparently. So we just kept going. And by that point, we were like, wow, you know, I, don't th I think we're unstoppable at this point. So I'm going to read uh, the next one is Psalms 91, 9, and 10. If you follow along with me. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. No disaster will come near your van, apparently. Mexico is an extremely long country, if you've ever driven through it. It's not recommended, actually, even today. 
But as we were driving through it, we had hit a funeral procession and got stranded there for several hours and, and then finally made it down to Veracruz. And we were making it really far south of Mexico near Tapachula, which is the border to Guatemala. About that time, we were driving at night in the rain and we hit a pothole. And all of a sudden, we hear this thump, 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 thump. And we're like, oh, no. This is how far we made it. We pull into this rest area that had all these Americans. Well, they spoke English. I think they were from Honduras, actually. But the one guy, Tony, comes out, and he's like, Dad, I don't know. I think it's just the brake pad and then we can fix it somehow with the rotor. I had no idea what was going on. My brother's kind of more mechanical than I am, so him and Tony were suddenly fixing this, this, this van. And they changed the brake pad, and like, they drove it around, and the, the new brake pad wore down, and somehow like, the thumping sort of stopped, and they're like, it's good enough. We'll just drive it like that. So we park at this rest area, and all these, all these men, about 35 men who spoke English, that were Latin Americans from New Orleans had been traveling down to Honduras. And Tony was the leader of this giant group of caravanners. And they had all this stuff. They just had washing machines and, and dryers and refrigerators and stoves and just like tons of appliances. And they're caravanning all this stuff down to their families in Honduras who were you know, going to be glad to have all these nice appliances. And Tony said, I don't understand something. You guys were driving at night when you got here. And we're like, I mean, yeah, we always drive at night. I, we've driven from Wisconsin to Seattle like 20 times. That's how you do it. You drive at night and in the day and you make it faster. He's like, no, you don't understand. This is Mexico. No one drives at night in Mexico, except the truckers. And all the truckers drive in a line, and every single one of them has a gun, and they protect each other. And my brother's like, oh, that's why there was only semis on the road. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. And I'm like, but Tony, man, don't even worry about it. We're fine. He's like, no, you don't understand. We had... We were at dusk and had bullets flying past us and had to pull off so we didn't get shot. And you guys are two white boys with no Spanish at all. You're a target. I'm like, Tony, it's going to be fine. And he said something that I'll never forget. He looked right at me and he said, oh, I get it. And I'm like, what? He said, you two have the protection of Jesus Christ. I was like, what? How does he know that? Does he know about the gas thing? And Tony said, the reason I know this is because I was a born-again Christian. And I loved Jesus. But, but when, when you love Jesus and you're a born-again Christian and then you choose alcohol, you can no longer be saved and so I'm lost forever. He said, but you're not lost. And I said, Tony, I don't think that's how it works. I, I remember Lee Venden saying, once married, always married, as long as you stay married. Once saved, always saved, as long as you stay saved. You could still be saved. He's like, no, I've chosen alcohol. I'm like, that's sad. He said, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you guys have the protection of Jesus, and we want to caravan with you. <laughs> and we're like, I don't know if we have anything to offer. We're broke. He's like, no, it's, it's perfect. He's like, we'll give you gas and food and room and board for the entire way to Honduras, if you just ride with us, that's all we want. Because we'll be safe if we're with you. 
And I'm like, wow, man, you have a lot of faith for somebody who's not saved. So we did it. We made it through Guatemala. We made it through Honduras. And we made it to this town in Honduras called San Pedro Sula. I think there was a young man who I got to sit by a couple weeks ago who was from San Pedro Sula. It's a dangerous city. It's probably the most dangerous city in Central America right now. Nothing happened to us at all. We were fine, by the grace of God. And Tony was right. His whole crew was fine. So they thanked us. We didn't do anything. It was all God. He sent us on our way. And we just kept driving. We made it to Nicaragua. Nicaragua is, was and is the most impoverished country, I believe. Don't quote me on statistics here, but maybe the most impoverished country in all of the Western Hemisphere. It's extremely poor. And so as we're driving along the Pan American Highway, you would see all these potholes just everywhere, everywhere, potholes. They don't fix their road, really. But then these little kids, like 9, 10 years old, would take a shovel, and they'd take like a little bit of gravel right as you're driving. They're chilling until you're driving by. And then they like run and pick up their shovel and they like put a little bit of dirt down into the hole and then it's like, you know, give me some money, I'm fixing the road. So this was their little thing and it was cute except I felt sad because it's all kids, you know. Where's the men who are supposed to be doing things? As we're driving through this pothole filled land, the potholes start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I swear in the distance I see a semi-truck disappear for a little bit and pop back up. And I thought, wow, I might, I might be seeing a mirage or something. Sure enough, we get up there and there's a pothole so big that your entire vehicle goes down about seven feet and goes <laughs> back up. And it wasn't a river or nothing, it was just a pothole. So they swallow vehicles whole. This was significant because as we started getting out of that area, we started getting to the mountainous region uh, of Nicaragua. And as we were cruising through the mountains thinking everything was great, we noticed one of our tires was really low. And my brother's like, are we good? And I'm like, I don't think so, man. It's like this much air. There was no run flats back then. I've never seen a tire have this much air and not go totally flat. I was like, it's a flat tire. We're, we're done. He's like, no, because if it was a flat tire, it would be thumping and thumping, and then we would like lose our rim and, and all the you know, tread on the tire. So we just were like, I mean, I guess it's just we're still going, right? We're just going to keep going. So we just keep going. We keep driving. We keep driving. We've gone about 30 miles. We pass a house. It's the only house in the whole valley. We go up over this mountain and we can see down the other side and it's just desolate. There's no more houses ever again. So my brother's like, I think we should maybe go back. I was like, you think? There's only one house for like 60 miles. So we go back to the only house, and the whole time, the tire is still this much air. Never went completely flat. And I was like, wow, is God really on our side like this? This is what it's like when you go out on a limb? This is amazing. We get to this gentleman's house, and he comes out like he was expecting us, and he's real friendly. We couldn't hear, understand anything he was saying. But he just looks at the tire, and he runs into his shop, which is bigger than his house, and he comes out with the exact tire already pumped up. It was a white steel wheel, and he jacks up the, the van, and he takes the wheel off, and he puts his wheel on, and he's like, God bless. And we're like, wow. How does this, does this guy just collect random tires for every size vehicle coming by? That's amazing. So off we were with this new spare this gentleman had blessed us with. Psalm 91, 14 through 16. 
Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. We were robbed countless more times, at least 30 or 40. But we made it to Alajuela, hallelujah, and we had no idea where to go once we got there. So we just started driving down this road, and it was basically right through the center of town. And as we come to the other side of town, we're going down this hill, and my brother's like, that's our cousin Kelvin. And I'm like, what? How is that possible? He's like, yeah, and I knew he was a missionary down here somewhere. He said he was going down like a couple months ago. So we just run into him, and sure enough, it's Calvin. And we get out of the car, and we're like, hey, man, we made it to Alle Alleluia. And he's like, it's Alajuela. Nice to meet you guys. How you doing? And I'm like, wow. And he's like, how did you guys get here? We're like, we just drove. He's like, what? You guys are crazy. Yeah, a little bit. So he took us to his place, which was at the only Adventist University in Central America. And we got to meet some cool people there. And we met somebody from Maranatha who was going to have us to their house so that we could start working for Maranatha, building a school and a church out in the mountains. And we thought, wow, we're really going to do it. We're going to make a difference. We're going to do all this work. And we did. And it was extremely hard work, all the volcanic rock and everything you have to dig out by hand. When we were there doing the mission work in the mountains, I just remember the roads in those countries are extremely narrow. Now, Seattle has some pretty narrow roads, okay, uh, compared to the Midwest. But Costa Rican roads are far, far worse and extremely dangerous. Many people die all the time, and I've, I've sadly seen a bunch of fatalities with my own eyes. So one night, we were going to go to dinner with some friends in the van, still with the same spare tire on it, several months later. And I just remember this mother of some of the friends say, Cuidado, peligro en la calle, which was, be careful, on the streets are dangerous. The roads are really dangerous. I'd learned a couple words by then. But we didn't really think about it because people kept saying dangerous, you know? And we were just like, ah, God's always watching out for us. We don't really care about that word that much now. So we piled into the van and we put our seat belts on and we started driving and it was raining and in the mountains, there's no street lights, so it's extremely dark. And as we're driving, we notice that on one side, you're right on the edge of the mountain, just like you'd see in you know, some cliffhanger movie. And it's about a 250-foot drop. But because of all the rainfall that happens in those countries. On the other side of the road, it's about 14 to 20 foot deep, and then the water can run under the road because otherwise you'd constantly have water washing over the road and no one would ever drive anywhere. So the only places that there's even a turn off at all is the occasional house that has a driveway that crosses this sort of deep culvert. And those driveways are about seven or eight feet wide just for one car and then the, you know, the road keeps going. So if you were to go off the road in either direction, you're doing real bad. It's nighttime. We know this road's dangerous. We're going 55, speed limit. And as we come up around a very sharp corner on the mountain, two sets of headlights are immediately in front of us. And we just freeze. Somebody's passing somebody, not a great idea. 
nothing we can do, and it was too, it was, it was too fast to do anything anyway. And suddenly my brother does something he's never done before or since. He stands up, I don't know who stands up driving, but he stands up and he hits the brake and he turns the wheel and the cars go flying by and he turns the wheel back and then we're all in silence, just keep driving. And about a minute later he looks over at me and he says, what happened? I said, you stood up and you slammed on the brake and you turned. I don't even know where you turned. And then the cars went past and then we got back on the road. He said, I never stood up. I never moved. He said, I saw the headlights and I completely froze and I didn't move at all, but I did feel something happening. It just wasn't me. And I thought, praise Jesus. This is amazing. Things just keep happening because we went out on a limb. Now we're out here doing this mission work. We went back several times over that stretch of terrain because I wanted to see where we turned off. And if you think about going 55 miles an hour, you would need about, I don't know the math, 80 feet, maybe more to be able to pull off and then pull back on, right? Even if you were like real fast. We found a driveway that was about eight feet and that was it. There was no place to turn off. In that entire, I mean from Cartago, the city we were going to visit for dinner, all the way to Cervantes, which is about 15 miles, it's just mountain road and there's nowhere to turn. So apparently, if I'm not crazy, God created somewhere for us to turn off and back on. That's how powerful God is. And that blew my mind because until that moment I thought, you know, he just freezes gas gauges once in a while. What I learned from these experiences, folks, is that if you're in your comfort zone, in your spiritual life, you can't see God work in the ways that he wants to work in you and through you. And when you get out of your comfort zone and you go out on a limb through faith, you will see God work in your life. And when you see God work in your life in those ways, it makes you excited. It makes you excited because you get to experience it firsthand and you get to tell others, hey, he's real and he cares and he's doing great things for me and he can do great things for you. And that's what it's all about. Thank you. I think we're going to have a song and then a closing prayer, correct? Please stand as we sing our hymn of dedication, 334, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Oh, 
God, thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us. As we go this afternoon to our separate places, help us to remember that you're always with us. No matter if we're in our comfort zone or if we step out of it for you, Lord, you're always with us. You're always protecting us and you love us so much. Thank you for all you do for us, Lord. In your name, amen.